Hey, when did the glam metal era actually end, kids? I heard something that said it was 1993, and you know, that might have been the very last death knell. But I think the seeds of destruction were sown a lot earlier than that. In fact, probably 1991. And I'm going to talk about that on the other side. Hello, you're listening to the John Huff Podcast. Oh, yeah. Ich bin müde, meine Freunde. Ich bin müde, meine Kinder. When you are reading German and you see a letter U, what appears to be a letter U, with the two dots over top, with the umlaut, this is your Deutsch lesson for today, for heute. When you see the umlaut, the two dots over the U, What that's telling you to do is to make what is to English ears and tongues a kind of bizarre U sound, all right? We're turning it from OO to E. Is that difference coming through? Is that translating for you? Changing it from OO to E. And that is a difficult sound for a lot of us Englishers to make, you know? So when I say, ich bin müde, I'm saying, I am tired. Ich bin müde, meine Freunde. I am tired, my friends. Ich bin müde, meine Kinder. I am tired, my children. Kids. The Kinder. <laughs> A little bit tired today, man, and I'm running behind schedule. I am recording this as I should be releasing this, but hey! That's the life of a busy musician, because normally I record on Mondays, right? Normally is uh, Monday is recording day, so I lay down the track in the morning, and then I spend the day editing, and then I slap it together, and Tuesday morning I hit release. Then I do all the things, right? But yesterday, Monday, Montag, I'm in the car, driving with my boy Ken the Zen down the 401. That's right by my house! to have a rehearsal, the final rehearsal, before the big Fresh Breath CD release show. Ho ho! Ken the Zen and I hired as the dream team the rhythm section for our dear friends Fresh Breath, who encouraged me yesterday at the rehearsal to have stolen Steven Tyler's pants when I had the chance. Steal those pants when you have the chance, kids. And I probably should have. And, you know, what are you going to do, man? It's all about choices. I chose not to steal Steven Tyler's pants. You're going to have to listen to last week's episode to find out what that's about. But we drove down the highway. It's about a two-hour rip down to where we were rehearsing yesterday. So Ken the Zen and I got to get on the road like we haven't in a long time. You know, we spent many happy hours at Ontario En Route's going pee beside each other at the urinals, which you can't even do anymore because of social distancing, you know? But it warmed the cockles, brought back some memories of being on the road, me and Ken the Zen. So we drove on down to rehearsal yesterday. We had a great time with Fresh Breath. We are very much stoked and looking forward to playing these release shows. One this weekend, one next weekend. It's going to be super duper and a lot of fun. Really love their EP. You should check out the new Fresh Breath EP. Go over to Bandcamp, type in Fresh Breath, and you will find it. Wonderful stuff. Folk rock, indie rock, alt country kind of stuff. And we're just having a really great time working on that music uh, individually and together. Zuzamen. We're having a good time doing that. It's coming together really well. I think the shows are going to be really, really good. And we're feeling it, and it's nice, man. It's nice to be back out in the world, even to have a little toe dipped into playing live music again, man. But yesterday, you know, a two-hour drive either way, got to be there by noon, which means I missed out on recording time in the morning. 
And then by the time we get back, there was stuff going on. Couldn't really get around to recording, okay? And I'm muda because I'm not used to driving that much. And then you, it's like you get to the place. I've talked about this in terms of performance. Like when you're on the road and you got a five hour drive to the next gig, normally when you're driving five hours to a place, the hard work is done when you get there. The drive was the work, right? And then you're at your vacation or your family's place or wherever it was you were going and you pop the top and you sit down and you put your feet up and it's a job done. When you're on the road, the work hasn't begun yet. <laughs> you drive the five and then you got to set up and you got to play a show and you got to be up and you got to the energy and you got to talk to people and the whole thing. The work begins when you arrive, you know? And so it was yesterday. You drive the two and then you set up and you play the rehearsal. And as fun as that is, and as much as that's coming together and it's becoming more natural, it's still work, man. It's still concentration. It's still physical. We got absolutely freaking swarmed by mosquitoes in ways that I have not seen since Northern Ontario. That was rough. And then, you know, you pack up and you drive the two hours back home. And then we had stuff to do. I helped my wife put together a TV stand. And, you know, I say that sincerely. I helped her. She is the technical one in this family, all right? I might be able to record podcasts, but when it comes to building stuff, when it comes to hammers and nails, she's the leader, okay? I just hand her stuff, <laughs> you know? But, I, you know, that took some time, and then we're tired, we're muda, and then it's bedtime, man. I didn't have time to get down to doing a podcast episode recording yesterday, so we're behind schedule just a little bit. Still hoping to get this out on Tuesday. And then I did not sleep well. Ich schlafe nicht gut. I think that's wrong. Anyways, I didn't sleep well because of freaking mosquito bites. And it wasn't even the ones that I picked up yesterday. Those are, have been somewhat dormant, <laughs> but I know they're lurking. But I got two mosquito bites on my freaking pinky that just kept me up, man, for two nights in a row now. Just insane, huge, itchy mosquito bites. Is this an age thing or are we getting into an era of like Spider-Man mosquitoes, like there's something radioactive about mosquitoes now, and they bite you, and the welts are huge, and they go on forever, and they're so itchy. Is this an older, th like some of my older people, like if you're above 50, if you're pushing like 60, give us late 40s people a tip. Does everything just get, you know, amplified now? Mosquito bites are worse. I don't know, sore throats are worse. Like, does it just get worse from here? And then that's an age thing. Like, we, we lose our resistance. Or is it just the effects of the vaccines? So I didn't sleep super good. And I'm a bit on edge, okay? I'm a bit on edge because I got a bug guy coming. <laughs> I have this army of wasps that have invaded my brickwork. And sometimes you got to call in the mercenaries, you know what I mean? And so I got a guy coming to deal with that sometime. And they give you the window. We're going to come between this time and this time. And you say, well, are they? And what time? So I've begun recording because I know I'm behind schedule. And I could be interrupted at any moment by a knock on the door and, you know, bug zappers here. So, ah. Uh, I don't know what that's doing to me. I don't know what being tired and waiting on the bug zapper is doing to my delivery here. But let's just hope we come up with something coherent, okay? And what I want to talk about is kind of the day the music died. And this is not going to be super duper put together, all right? I've just been noodling around this notion because... Last week, our old pal Jay sent me along a new track by the band Crazy Licks, all right? That's Crazy L-I-X-X. -X. And as soon as you see L-I-X-X, -X, I think you know what you're getting into, right? This is your modern, everyday glam metal band, kids from Schweden. Why is all, you know, Steel Panther aside, why is all the glam stuff coming out of Schweden these days? 
Is it something to do with the lack of vaccines? She got Crazy Licks, that band that we talked about earlier this year, Nestor the Band, whose song 1989, by the way, is probably in the top five for me of tunes this year. <laughs> That's saying a lot. That tune, 1989 by Nestor the Band from Schweden, is one of my favorite songs of the year, particularly among the tunes we've talked about. So if you have not listened to that song, 1989 by Nestor, and you like yourself some 80s-flavored glam rock, that's a tune to go listen to, all right? So along comes Crazy Licks, and they've been around for like 20 years. This is not new. <laughs> Crazy Licks released this tune called Anthem for America. Brave or what? You know, a foreign country talking about an anthem for America? Don't tread on me, man! So they come along with this kind of hair metal, sorry, glam metal lament. For what happened to the youth of America, man? You used to be the beacons of nonconformity. You used to be rock and roll and F you, and now you're all corporate and the same. <laughs> Talk about a broad generalization, man. And maybe there's something to that, I don't know. But there's a lyric in the song that says somebody pulled the plug around 1993 and it's never been the same. And that got me to thinking. Was it 1993? Is that when the glam era really ended? And I don't really have a super duper great answer to that question, but I got some thoughts. You know, the best I can muster when I'm muda is thoughts. So when I took a look at it, 1993. And they say that's the year that somebody pulled the plug. And when they're talking about pulling the plug, they're really talking about, I think, they're really talking about, you know, the rock and roll. <laughs> the real party anthems, the real rock and roll from the 80s, you know, the glam metal kind of scene, the party rock scene. I think they're talking about that going away circa 1993. But my observation is if the plug was pulled, in 1993, I think it was hanging by a freaking thread by probably 1991. And I'm going to submit to you, Mina Kinder, that the last year of the party, the last real year of the full on party, the last hour before which people began to pass out and fall into the pool or drift away to get arrested. <laughs> the last year before really wasted folks toddled off down the street and opened some wrong neighbor's door and fell asleep on the couch. The last year was 1990. Oh yeah, man. The last year was 1990. Now let's not overlook 1991, okay? A lot of people talking about 1991 this year because it was 30 years ago that what is considered a monumental year in rock and roll history happened, okay? So we can't say anything more until we talk about 91. 1991, you get the release of Metallica's Black Album, one of the top-selling records of all freaking time. 1991, you get the album that shook up the world, which was Nevermind by Nirvana. Now, if you don't see the plug slipping out of the holes I need holes! If you don't see the plug slipping out of the holes with Nevermind in 1991, then you're looking in the wrong place, man. Pearl Jam releases 10 in 1991. Guns N' Roses, of course, releases Use Your Illusion 1 and 2 in 1991. R.E.M. releases Out of Time in 1991. Red Hot Chili Peppers release Blood Sugar Sex Magic in 1991. Soundgarden releases Bad Motor Finger in 1991. And U2 releases Ach Tung Baby, Attention Baby, in 1991. That is, whether you like U2, whether you like the grunge, that's a monumental freaking year. It's monumental for the Black Album alone, man. But you get that Pearl Jam record, which is now legend. Guns N' Roses, I mean, the world had been waiting <laughs> since Appetite for Guns N' Roses, you know, to follow that up. And they released two records. And I've never been a giant Guns N' Roses guy, gotta be honest. But in terms of 
relevance and history. Those are big records, man. And this is still when rock was king, but you can see from the flavor of those 1991 records how it's changing. Now, you could argue, all right, you can try to lump Guns N' Roses into the hair metal thing, into the glam metal thing, but we know that they really weren't. All right, they were peripherally part of the metal scene. And when they appeared, you know, with Appetite, they had the look. But Guns N' Roses is also pioneers of a subgenre that we call sleaze rock, all right? And this is L.A. Guns. This is Faster Pussycat. This is Guns N' Roses. Guns N' Roses are the undeniable heavyweight champion. <laughs> but you hear that Appetite record, it's much less slick than a lot of what was going on in the glam scene. You know, it bites just a little bit harder. It's a little more street, a little more aggressive, a little more angry, a little more raw, a little more real, you could argue. But there was a sound, and I can't really describe what the sound is, of the kind of sleaze metal bands that came out of L.A., out of the Strip at that time, late 80s into the early 90s. And it was a far less slick and produced sound. It was very much more raw rock and roll, right? And these guys had a look and a sound and a vibe that was freaking sleazy. And that is not, <laughs> that is not an insult. That is an acknowledgement of an idiom. That's an acknowledgement of a style, man. But even Use Your Illusion 1 and 2, not glam metal records, man. And this is 1991. We're already beginning to see, in my opinion, the end of the line. Let's look at 1990. All right, I went back and looked at 1990 and said, what records from that genre, from the party rock world, you know, monumental records, records that people remember, records that had some sort of weight and relevance, were released in 1990, all right? And there's a relatively comprehensive list. You got ACDC's The Razor's Edge, which was freaking huge. Everybody do Thunderstruck. And that was the first time, incidentally, in my humble opinion, that Brian Johnson began to sound like a computer. <laughs> the vocals on The Razor's Edge, to me, sound computer generated, like something was up. And I'm not sure Brian Johnson's voice was still there at that point. Like, I, I can't really qualify. Maybe it's just the way it was produced, but I felt like there were some studio tricks happening. Incidentally, on the new, the brand new ACDC stuff, he's begun to sound like Brian Johnson again, so I'm thinking like a long layoff from singing helped. Well, that's just an aside, all right? So you got ACDC, The Razor's Edge. This is 1990. Cinderella's Heartbreak Station, the Damn Yankees record, Extremes Porno Graffiti, which was freaking huge, Firehouse's self-titled record, Judas Priest released Painkiller, Love Hates Blackout in the Red Room, that's a bit of a deep cut, all right, but those of us who are paying attention recognize that as a monumental album for a band that might have gone bigger than they had had they not released it in 1990. You know, I always thought if you were one of those bands that came along 92, 93, you were cooked. But this is showing that even if you came along in 1990, in that world, you were already kind of cooked. And that's Blackout in the Red Room. Megadeth released Rust in Peace. Pantera released Cowboys from Hell. That was seismic. <laughs> that was a game changer right there. Poison released Flesh and Blood. And if you are a Poison person... You probably look at that and say, you know what? Probably shouldn't even be on the list. It was the last gasp of Poison kind of being at the top of the game, all right? Already by 1990, Flesh and Blood is the one that's already kind of forgotten. Queensryche released Empire, and that's huge. All right, that was Silent Lucidity. That was, you know, people are going to argue that Operation Mindcrime is their true masterpiece, and maybe they're right about that. But Empire was still a huge and relevant and commercially successful record. That's 1990, and has Queensryche ever been back to that level since? Nine, they haven't, but that record was massive, and that's 1990. 
Slaughter released Stick It To You, and you can take or leave what you like from that. Tesla unleashed a pestilence upon the world when they released the five-man acoustical jam. And, you know, signs, signs, everywhere, sign, acoustic. And a lot of people point to this, Elvis's 1968 comeback special aside, a lot of people look at Tesla's five-man acoustical jam as kind of the first one in the MTV Unplugged kind of thing. And they'll be glad they recorded that, man. Because <laughs> you still hear signs on the radio. And I have said before, and I will say again, I am not a fan of acoustic records. I am not a fan, let me qualify that, I am not a fan of heavy rock songs done acoustically on a record. I like albums that are acoustic, that are designed to be acoustic. You know what I mean? I like your singer-songwriters. It's what I play. But I do not like acoustic versions of rock songs. And I think Eric Clapton's Layla is a crime against rock and roll, that acoustic version, all right? Because you're taking one of the great hard rock licks of all time and turning it into that. And that's sad! And Tesla released that record the five-man acoustical jam, and that blew up thanks to signs. I mean, man, oh man, Tesla's still playing big rooms because of that, and good on them. But that unleashed the wave of the MTV Unplugged stuff, and I just hate all of that stuff. <laughs> I'm not really prone to having opinions on this show, but I really dislike a lot of that stuff. Like the Alice in Chains one, okay. But rock songs are meant to be played as rock songs, man. Stop taking out the electric guitar and putting in your dang acoustic and making the girls faint. Well, you know what? Maybe there's some value in that. Gonna have to think that one over. I was never into the acoustic thing. Even King's X released it some acoustic material, and I'm like, ah, guys. Plug and play, man. We're here for the power of rock and roll. But that came out. Well, I will say this about Tesla, all right? One time, I don't know, like 12 years ago, maybe more, something like that, Tesla actually came to L-Town. Imagine that. And on like a Monday or Tuesday night, they set up in a big club here in town, such as we have big clubs here in town, and it was to be the five-man acoustical jam show. And, okay, I'll go, because they're playing six blocks from my freaking house. How often is Tesla going to come, so I'll go? Even though I'm not a big fan of the acoustic versions, all right? Something monumental happened that night, my friends. Meine Freunde. Tesla did their five-man acoustical jam thing, and it was fun. It was a lot of fun, actually. I will give it to them. And live is always better, okay? And so they're playing, and that's cool, and then they come to Love Song, all right? Now, those of you who are around back in the day know Love Song as the biggest Tesla original, all right? Nothing they ever did, I think, topped the success of Signs, but we know that's a cover. Love Song was a, a ballad, you know, one of the big ballads of the whole glam scene. And Tesla's not really a glam band either, okay? There are certain bands that stand apart from the scene. Tesla was in that scene, they played in that scene, and they had that kind of sound. But there was a depth, lyrically and musically, to Tesla that kind of went a little bit beyond, and it was a little bit different. All right, Tesla's a great band. I really love Tesla, all right? I'm not bagging on Tesla for that acoustic record. I'm saying I really like that band, and I wish they'd played those songs the way they were meant to be played. But hey, it worked just great for them. So they do the five-man thing, and it's fine, it's cool. And then they're playing Love Song, and they're playing it acoustically. Now, if you know that tune, you know that there is just a wonderful freaking guitar solo in that song. It just, I mean, it's a ballad and all that stuff, but just the guitar kicks in and there's a really emotional and banging guitar solo in it. It's really, really great. And so they're playing the song acoustically and that's cool. And then they're coming up to that point. And then all of a sudden, one of the dudes whips out an electric guitar and probably jumps on a pedal and the whole thing just blew up. And they went into that guitar solo for reels, kids. For reals, meine Kinder. And the freaking roof blew off that joint. The whole band kicked in for reals. 
and played that solo from Love Song the way it's meant to be played, man. And just the way the hair stood up on the back of your neck. The way your heart rate elevated proved the point. Play rock and roll the way rock and roll was meant to be played, man. The difference is striking. <laughs> and then they just stayed plugged in and they played a bunch of stuff plugged in. For real freaking Tesla, man. None of this stools, none of this legs crossed stuff. Tesla! <laughs> and they did a cover of War Pigs by Black Sabbath, and it just knocked us backwards, man. <laughs> like I saw part of my skeleton come flying out of my arm at one point. It was great, and I loved it. And they sounded amazing. And this is an itty-bitty club in L-Town. Tesla, man. I mean, this was after the fact, all right? This was long after they pulled the plug in the Crazy Licks song. And it was great. So I will hand Tesla that, all right? Warrant released Cherry Pie in 1990. And, you know, if you're going to put together your pantheon of five glam metal records that anybody might have heard of, <laughs> who was not into that music, probably they know Cherry Pie, okay, man? I told the story about my boy Monty from Galactic Cowboys being on the road with King's X. Galactic Cowboys toured with King's X a lot. And he's standing side stage after Galactic Cowboys played, and King's X is up, and doesn't Janny Lane appear beside him? And they strikes up a conversation. Janny Lane says to him, hey, man, you're the luckiest guy in the world. Monty says, what do you mean? And he says... Man, you get to watch Doug Pinnock, Doug Pinnock play bass every night. Thought Monty was Doug's bass tech. <laughs> Monty says, oh, yeah, man, uh, I'm in Galactic Cowboys. We just played. Oh, sorry, man, says Janie. And that's kind of a funny story. I don't know if it was during that conversation or during some other conversation that the topic of Cherry Pie came up and Janie Lane said, look, man, that song bought me a house. <laughs> and you gotta say, all right, Jenny, we'll give you that, man. Cherry Pie bought you a house. And that was a record that people remember from the glam metal scene, and that's 1990, okay? And Winger released In the Heart of the Young. So what you get from this list is a lot of big bands of the era releasing big albums of the era, okay? Now you fast forward to 1991. All right, this is a year later. We've already talked about the monumental rock albums, and in some cases, the scene-changing albums that were released in 1991. But what was going on in the glam metal scene? All right, Skid Row released a Slave to the Grind in 1991. Many would argue the last relevant Skid Row album. All right, so that's Last Ditch. And then what do you get? Well, Alice Cooper released Hey Stupid, that's cool, but, you know, Alice Cooper also separate from that world. <laughs> it's another Alice Cooper record. He was there long before, he's there long after. Mr. Big released Lean Into It, okay. All right, that's a thing. Ugly Kid Joe released Ugly As They Wanna Be, okay, we'll take that. And Ozzy released No More Tears, and that was a big one. All right, people know No More Tears. That was still peak Aussie, peak relevance, you know? That was a big record. So we will hand you that. 1990, I gave you a list as long as your arm of relevant albums released by relevant bands. I'm already at the end of 1991. Not to say that there weren't albums released, okay? Slick Toxic, David Lee Roth, Danger Danger, Europe, Kicks, LA Guns. A lot of bands released records they are not records that left a mark. They are not peak records from those bands. And then you begin to see something very, very telling, kids. All right? 1991, who are the all-time poster boys smoking in the boys' room of hair metal, of glam metal? It's Motley Crue, man. And what does Motley Crue release in 1991? They release decade of decadence wait what motley crew released a compilation in 1991 rat released a compilation in 1991 poison 
released a live album. Swallow This Live. Now, I'm going to say something about Swallow This Live, okay? And it has nothing to do with the live part. <laughs> they also included a couple of new studio tracks on that. I think it was like a double live record. And one of them was So Tell Me Why. And So Tell Me Why, I think, remains probably my favorite Poison song, okay? So if there's ever John Huff podcast trivia, So Tell Me Why by Poison, a studio track added to the Swallow This Live compilation, is probably my favorite Poison song, all right? But what are we seeing? What are we seeing here, kids? 1991, you've got the biggest acts in the genre releasing compilations, live records, not even dropping studio albums. And the bands that are dropping studio albums are not dropping studio albums that registered. Except maybe Bullet Boys, all right? Bullet Boys released Freak Show in 1991. And that had a couple of big songs on it. Hang on, St. Christopher. Anybody remember that one? And Talk to Your Daughter, okay? Those were relatively big songs. I don't think they were smooth up in you, but they were still relatively big songs. So Bullet Boys is kind of carrying the flame. But this is 1991, and if you take a look at this, bands releasing live records, compilations, the jig is up, man. That 1993 plug, that thing is hanging by a thread already, in my opinion, in 1991. What do we see in 1992? Like, maybe 91 was just an off year, all right? What do we get in 1992? Well, we get some interesting stuff. Megadeth releases Countdown to Extinction. All right, that's got to be the biggest Megadeth record. Not everybody will say it's the best Megadeth record, but it is undeniably the biggest. I had a transcendent moment driving out of Toronto one night, presumably in 1992. We were listening in the car, I reckon, to Q107 on the AM-FM stereo cassette player. And they played back-to-back -back Symphony of Destruction by Megadeth and Empire by Queensryche. You want your skull crushed, kids, is what I want you to do. I want you to make just a little tiny playlist. <laughs> Two songs. Symphony of Destruction by Megadeth followed by Empire by Queensryche. I want you to put on your headphones. I want you to turn it up loud. And I want you to remember how great rock music could be. But Megadeth released that in 1992. Slaughter released The Wildlife in 1992. That had a couple of songs on it. It might be one people remember. The biggest, you know, record from that year connected to the glam metal scene's got to be Bon Jovi's Keep the Faith. But they're another band that transcends the scene. Bon Jovi is a legitimate, you know, they're one of the bands that still play from that era. And that tells you that they are a band apart. Whether you like Bon Jovi or not, or their lyrics, which I have issues with. But again, I'm not in the habit of giving opinions, really, on this show. But that was a big record by a big band, so it counts. 1992, Pantera's Vulgar Display of Power. Ugly Kid Joe again with America's Least Wanted. And that had Cats in the Cradle on it. That had I Hate Everything About You on it. So that was a big record. All right. You know, if you're connected to the scene, you remember that one. But we're already out of gas, man. There were new albums. Steelheart, Bang Tango, Def Leppard released Adrenalize, and that tells you something, too. Does anybody beyond the scene remember anything Def Leppard released after Hysteria? Anybody? Anybody out there? Maybe they remember Let's Get Rocked. But that's it, man. Already with Adrenalize in 1992, you've got, I'm not saying a drop-off in quality, I'm saying a drop-off in relevance. It's already happening way before 1993. And there were new records by Tora Tora and Firehouse and Faster Pussycat and Extreme, but again, nothing that registered, man. Nothing that registered. Nothing really has registered since 1990. I think Crazy Licks was a few years you know, behind. And then you go ahead and you look at 1993, which is where they say the plug was pulled. And what do you see there? Already at this point, grunge has taken over. <laughs> I've talked about this. I've talked about the fault line. 
where Z Rock would play Jackal and then play Pearl Jam, you know, or Nirvana. 1993, Rob Halford releases the first fight record. So Rob's already out of Judas Priest at that point. Judas Priest is releasing a compilation. Iron Maiden releases three live albums. Kiss releases a live three. Van Halen releases a live album. You got a Duff McKagan solo record, so, you know, Guns N' Roses has flown apart. There's a Quiet Riot record. Nobody even knew that. There's a Scorpions record. And Vince Neil releases a solo record. So, you know, the stalwarts of the era, it's all blown apart. There's just nothing by 1993. And Crazy Licks is right about that. So maybe what they're saying is that, yeah, we knew the edges were frayed circa 1991. And it was 1993 when they finally yanked the cord. And that's not to say that party rock and rock anthems and the glam rock, you know, was not produced anymore after that. It was. Jackal kept making records. You know, bands kept going. And you had some kind of sad moments. <laughs> You had some kind of sad moments when bands that were big in the 80s started trying to release sonically relevant, a.k.a. grunge records in the 90s. <laughs> so you get these guys who used to play and who pioneered and were the pinnacle of the party rock, of the glam metal, trying to make you know, grunge records in the 90s, and that's a sad thing, and none of them went freaking anywhere, let's be honest. The kids weren't down with that, man. And they, you know, fell out of relevance, and some of them resurged, you know, later, like 20 years later, the nostalgia circuit, you know, county fairs, that kind of thing. But, you know, there was still some good stuff that happened. All right, 1993, Shotgun Messiah released a really great record called Violent New Breed. Are they part of the glam metal scene? Maybe, maybe not. But there's a tune on the Shotgun Messiah record, Violent New Breed, 1993, called Monkey Needs, which is just a banging tune, man. And it's not, you know, we're talking about bands shifting genre here, right? And I haven't listened to a whole lot of Shotgun Messiah previous to that. This is not a glam rock song. <laughs> It's not even a party rock song, but it's a banging hard rock song. So Monkey Needs by Shotgun Messiah, 1993. And Winger actually released Pull. This is one of the bands I'm talking about that tried to shift genres just a little bit, you know, in the early 90s to try to stay relevant. And Winger's one of the bands. You know, you ask somebody to name off 10 glam metal bands, they're going to say Winger, okay? <laughs> they're just going to. And they released this album called Pull, 1993. I think, you know, Kip was already seeing the writing on the wall here. It's like, we gotta change some stuff. So let's release this kind of heavier, darker record. It's not quite a grunge album, but it's not quite a glam metal album. And there's a tune on Pull called Junkyard Dog, which is just a banger. Just a banger. So if you want to see the state of what might have been circa 1993... Go listen to Junkyard Dog by Winger. Go listen to Monkey Needs by Shotgun Messiah. You see where it might have gone. You see where it might have gone had not the whole glam metal scene just been whitewashed. And you don't even see it anywhere or hear it anywhere anymore. <laughs> All of this really great music that's just tainted, you know, tarred with the glam metal brush. And that's really too bad, because you turn on your classic rock radio, and you will catch Van Halen. But again, Van Halen existed long before. Van Halen was the pioneer of all this, you know, before it got silly. It was just fun back in the day. And you will occasionally, of course, you'll still hear Def Leppard. And you'll still hear that dang Tesla song. But what else are you going to hear? Guns N' Roses again. Guns N' Roses transcends. Bon Jovi transcends. Metallica transcends. What else are you going to hear? You know, there was a station that launched here in L-Town many, many years ago, and they would play Skid Row, and they would play Cinderella, and I was so excited! <laughs> like, yay, it's back! There used to be a station in Toronto called The Hog. Anybody remember The Hog? It was early 90s. The Hog was around for a couple of years. Incredibly irreverent rock radio, like dangerously so at times. 
Yeah, but they would play all the stuff, man. They'd play Crew and Cinderella, and they'd play all the stuff. And it was great, man. But then the whole thing just disappeared. The plug was indeed pulled, and it's whitewashed ever since. Like, we don't even acknowledge the 10 years <laughs> when that music ruled the freaking world. And that's too bad, because there's a lot in there that people are missing now. But I argue, Crazy Licks, that if the plug was pulled in 1993, it was already hanging out of the wall by 1991. And people are going to argue with me about that. And that's the nature of the game, man. It's all about the discourse. And I'm not saying there weren't big and relevant records in 91, 92, 93. I'm just saying the number and weight of them dropped off substantially after 1990. And that's too bad, kids, you know, but that's the way it goes. Grunge certainly didn't last forever. It had like a four-year run before the new metal came in, and we're all still scratching our heads just a little bit. <laughs> but it's all good, and it's okay. It's just something that was on my mind as I was thinking about this lyric from Crazy Licks, you know. But I gotta wrap up. I gotta get this thing edited and get it delivered out there to the people. But I gotta make an acknowledgement. I gotta make a couple acknowledgements, all right? Now, I've talked on this podcast, all of you out there with bands or with shows, and you're trying to build an audience and build a community. You gotta acknowledge people, man. Acknowledge the people who interact with you. So I gotta give a shout out to J Bo Billman. I don't know if it's J Bo or Jabbo. I feel like it's J Bo. J Bo Billman of Grinder Blues, who caught wind of me talking about the band on last week's episode sent me a little comment on the Instagram to say thank you, to which I responded, hey, great show, looking forward to the new record, to which he responded, I'll keep you updated. And I hope you do, j -Bo. And thanks for reaching out, and thanks for acknowledging that people are talking about your stuff. Got another like on that post from KXM. Whoa! <laughs> KXM is another Doug Pinnock side project, all right? Grinder Blues is one of, like, 50. And KXM is probably the most high-profile one. It's got Ray Luzier from Corn on drums, Luge, Luzier, however Ray says it, an incredible monster freaking drummer. And it's got George Lynch, ex Dokken, ex Lynch Mob. Lynch Mob still exists, but they're changing their name. So it's George, and it's Ray, and it's Doug, and it's KXM. And if you're into some more kind of technical metal kind of stuff, I mean, they're all amazing players. They are amazing players. And they've dropped, I think, three records now, KXM. So go listen to some of that, man. It's really, it's heavy, groovy, some, you know, George Lynch setting the fretboard ablaze. And Ray Luzier is just, you know, not human. <laughs> and But KXM acknowledged that post, and that's wonderful, and thank you. And, you know, I did Wine Friday last Friday night. It's a thing I'm doing on Instagram on Friday nights. I'm just going live, talking a bit of wine, talking about what's ever, you know, whatever's going on. And I was drinking a bottle of Sangiovese from Bellini, which is an Italian winery. And I tagged them and didn't Bellini just write back with a little heart. So even Italian wineries get it. Acknowledge when people are saying nice things about your stuff. I appreciate all of those people doing that. I appreciate all of you listening to me ramble on here about whatever it is I'm talking about. I appreciate you welcoming the show back and supporting it and, you know, giving me encouragement. But I'm going to shut up shutting up like I do. You can find me on Instagram at JW underscore Huff. That's where most of the action is. Follow the Facebook page, John Huff Podcast on Facebook. I do cross post there. I'm on the Twitter at JWS Huff. I'm out there in the world. You can find all the episodes on my website at john-huff.com, along with a lot of music that I've played on and all my old blog posts are still there. If you want to read about touring or if you want a little bit of an uplift, that's all on there. I thank you for listening. Remember, good things do happen when you put yourself out there. And hey, I'll check you later. Everything about